everyone. Good afternoon. Um, welcome. Thanks so much for, for being here with us virtually. Uh, my name is Aaron Malkin. I'm the literary director and dramaturg at New York Theatre Workshop. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. And we are so, uh, so excited to be here with you today. Uh, we are broadcasting this webinar from Zoom and simultaneously are live streaming on Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us and being part of the New York Theatre Workshop community. Um, a couple of things before we begin. This masterclass is free to everybody in our community and will live on after today, uh, archived on our website. Um, and if you're in a position to support our work, we would really appreciate uh, any sort of donation that you might be able to make. You'll find a link to donate in the chat. It was on the screen that you just saw. Um, and we will be back again at the end with some more information. Um, to give you a little structure, we are so grateful to have Jeremy O'Harris with us today. Um, he's going to talk for about 30 to 40 minutes and it's going to be an interactive conversation and then we'll save about a half an hour uh, for question and answer. If you have a logistical question, please use the Q&A feature on Zoom or you can write a comment uh, on Facebook and that will get over to us on Zoom. And if you have a question for Zer Jeremy, you can use the same feature and we will uh, do our best to get as many, to get to as many of the questions as we can. Um, for those of you who may not know, Jeremy is a writer and performer who is normally based in New York City. Um, his plays include Slave Play, Daddy, Black Exhibition, Dragon One, Water Sports or Insignificant White Boys, uh, and a boys company presents Tell Me If I Am Hurting You. Um, he co-wrote uh, A24's upcoming film Zola with Janixa Bravo, and we are so grateful to have him here with us today. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Great. Um, thank you so much this, for being here. Thank you for having me. This feels really weird. I'm just sort of talking to myself alone in um, uh, the middle of London. So, um, <laughs> hello. Um, I wish I could like actively um, see and engage with all of you, but I can't. Um, but thank you for coming to this weird little chat. Um, I decided to call this today, um, you know, so you devoted your life to a medium that's now in a coma, <laughs> um, how to write for it. Um, but uh, I also thought it might be fun to think about what, um, what, what we should all be doing right now or how we can do it right now. Because I think that, you know, I spend a lot of my life um, in a digital landscape and online. And I've been reading a lot of disparate uh, feelings and viewpoints on where we are right now and how we can move forward. And there's a lot of fear um, and a lot of frustration, but I haven't seen a lot of excitement about what um, this moment can be for us. And so I wanted to present um, a, 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 a few tools that I've been engaging with to um, maybe excite some um, ideas for how to write in a dystopia, um, because we're currently living in one. Um, so uh, the thing that I wanted to do, um, I hope that everyone has their Q&A and chat buttons really at the ready, um, because I thought that it might be really fun to structure this master class, um, like more of a master lab. Um, I don't think that I know any more um, than anyone else that's currently watching and engaging right now. And I think that it could be really helpful if we all use our collective brains to start figuring out some ways that um, uh, we can build uh, new dramaturgies for a dystopia. So um, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and so I have this little whiteboard that I've made. Um, and uh, we're gonna call this thing um, Dramaturgies for Dystopias uh, 101. And um, here, I need to move this so I can actually see it. Uh, whatever, I can't do that. There we are. Dramaturgies for Dystopias 101. And um, as you can see, I badly wrote my name here. Um, my name is Jeremy O'Harris, um, in case you had forgotten. Um, and um, I wanted to just start, um, start getting some ideas from you guys. I mean, I think that one of the things that's really difficult right now when we think about the nature of playwriting is that for most of us, we imagine that uh, writing a play is something that we do um, at the moment for an audience, or many of us think of it as um, something that we do 
for a specific audience. Uh, it could be an audience of 10 um, if you're doing a play for a small community. Um, it could be an audience of 200 if you're doing a play at New York Theatre Workshop, or it could be an audience of 1,000 if you're doing a play at the Avignon Festival. Um, but right now, many of us are doing plays um, for ourselves and maybe for a community that exists purely digitally, um, an audience that we won't see or can't see. And so I'm really interested to hear from you guys right now, and I hope that, that, that people are, are able to engage with the chat feature while this is sharing. Um, I wanna see from you guys, what are some of the things that um, theater is supposed to give you um, uh, when you when you start thinking of writing a play? Um, and let's see how we can maybe uh, write plays for a space, um, for an audience that can create that same experience if they aren't in a building or sitting with 200 other people, right? Um, so Aaron? Yes, so if you if people want to write, use the Q&A feature to write in your answers to Jeremy's question, uh, we can crowdsource them. And there's also an amazing feature so you can upvote. So if you see something that you agree with, you can click the little thumb and then that will give us a sense of scale. So everybody doesn't have to write the same version, a different version of the same thing. Um, I think I should also expound upon um, something as I as I start as we wait for some of these questions to come in or some of these ideas. Um, something that I've been thinking about a lot is the fact that um, this moment with the coronavirus and um, self isolation feels like um, a once in a lifetime moment because it's something that none of us have ever experienced before. Um, but when we start thinking about the fact that many people um, had predicted that something like this would happen. That um, that these that this was like an inevitability of science. Um, we can start thinking about other things that uh, science is telling us now that might shape our future, right? Um, and how it might be important for us to start thinking about these future dramaturgies um, and their necessities as we look forward and look at like you know the dangers of climate change and what that might do to the buildings that we that we are currently in. What do we do if in five years there are rolling blackouts all across America that make lighting a room for 200 people not only irresponsible but impossible? You know, um, what do we do if there is some major global um, uh, like, you know, um, seismic climate shift that makes it um, very difficult for us to leave our homes again. How will, we, how will we still be able to create spaces of connectivity through our very ancient art form of storytelling that began in, you know, in like began in like you know, around fires, you know, for some people who like to talk about the hearth as the like heartbeat of the, Amer of the, of the, of the idea of the theater. Where, how can we start looking towards the future um, now so that we can give tools to our children and our children's children to, to keep making the form that we all have devoted our lives to? So Jeremy, some answers that are coming in. Uh, plays give you a sense of community, experiencing the same thing all together, relating emotions to one another. I feel this, does anyone else? It's supposed to give you a new way of looking at an old story. Um, with so much content, theater should capitalize on this discomfort of not being a voyeur, maybe push you to feel some strange feelings, confront some uncomfortable issues, Great. connection. So let's start, let's break, this apart. let's break some of these apart. So, so one of the things that it said, one of the first things was community, right? Um, it gives us, theater gives us a sense of community. Um, let's keep going. What, were, what was another one? Relating emotions to one another. Um, Great. New ways of looking at an old story. Great. Uh, um, push you to push you to feel some strange feelings. Confront some uncomfortable issues. Great. I think this is a great place for us to start really quickly um, and like look at how we can unpack uh, some of these things in um, uh, for a new a new landscape. So um, let's look at communities. One of the things that I've been really excited about and really interested in is the ways in which uh, during this crisis, right, there's been um, there's been a new focus and a new um, 
import on finding micro communities, right? So like if that micro community is just like your neighbors upstairs who are, um, you know, uh, of, of a vulnerable class of people who need your help getting groceries because you are younger, more able-bodied, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You now, you now have um, a new community that you've been able to form with them that you might have missed in your daily life. You might have never noticed, you know, your neighbor in 3C before. Um, and that's a really amazing opportunity and an amazing way to reframe who we think the community of theater goers is, right? Um, when we think about the, th the people who can go to the theater as we see it now, even a theater like New York Theater Workshop, um, there's, that's a limited group of people. So one of the opportunities that we have here is looking at who hasn't been served by theater and how this new moment can serve them. So communities I saw often unserved by um, theaters in the way that we had known them in North America for the most part, um, was that I saw a lot of my disabled friends unable to visit the theater with the same ease and um, uh, consistency that I could. Um, because for many theaters, there are a limited number of not only like seats for general populace, but a very, very limited number of seats for people who are disabled. So um, this, this opportunity gives us the opportunity to make theater that all of those people can see. Not to mention the price, the, uh, the class, the, and also regions. As someone who grew up in Martinsville, Virginia, unable to ever see any plays in New York, um, the idea that playwrights in New York now have to think about making plays outside of that broadens this community. So when I think about this question of communities and who plays are for, the first, and, and how to build those things by just um, the fact of text, and not the fact of written text for um, um, the purpose of drama or dramatic literature, I think immediately of closet dramas. Now, I don't know how many people are familiar with closet dramas, but closet dramas were a, a major, um, have, have been a major source and um, a, a point of, like, um, uh, it's been, they've been a major source of, of uh, expression for outsiders inside of the theatrical tradition. So um, many women and um, many political iconoclasts in the 18th century, 19th century, and early 20th century, like ran towards closet dramas as a space to express things um, uh, for readership and an audience that, um, and a community that uh, would have been denied those things had they been in a major public setting where women were barred from writing plays and where people of color were barred from writing plays. And if you're writing plays that threaten the state, those plays often weren't shown. So people were able to create a sense of community through these sort of mixtapes of plays. Like someone would write a play that was really, um, that had like a raucous and complex world, um, uh, like, um, uh, energy to it. And those plays would move around in, um, through communities via just the text itself. And I think that's a really exciting thing for us to think about now, right? Um, how can we, what, what are the things that are upsetting us and moving us? Um, the things that we've been afraid to say or unable to write um, because of our want or need to be produced that um, have stopped us from writing those things down. Um, in this moment, in the current climate, when we're all stuck in our homes and no one's going to have a play put on the stage for months, maybe years to come now, um, because pipelines are disrupted, like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This gives you the opportunity, if you think about every play you write from here on out as a potential closet drama, something that can only exist as a text, to write anything you want. And that's liberating, you know, and you can build a community from uh, this, this um, uh, expressive, complex, and like um, possibly violent drama you've written um, that can only exist inside of someone's imagination. So um, while, while thinking of com the community that can be based around a closet drama, I have compiled um, a few plays that really excite me um, that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, Aaron. Yes. Um, what's the best way to share a link here? The best way to share a link would be, I think, if you you can uh, in the chat, you can chat all panelists and attendees. Great. And I'll then that, that will go out to everyone. 
One second, guys. And Uno, uh -huh. maybe we can take those links and copy them into the Facebook comments so the folks on Facebook can get them as well. Great. Um, I'm going to do something a little. Let's see. Hold on. Um, OK. Let me unscreen share this. OK. Okay, so this is my master class Google Drive. And um, I filled it out with some plays that really excite me, plays that um, generally are plays that have moved me um, in the way that I think closet dramas move, have moved a lot of other people. And some of these are texts as well. But um, the one of the plays I wanted to show you guys was a play called The Hip Hop Waltz of Eurydice. Um, which there's also the text of in here as well. Um, but um, The Hip Hop Waltz of Eurydice is a play that was written by Reza Abdo in 1990. Um, and uh, Reza was one of the most important playwrights in uh, the 20th century in my mind. Um, he lived in Los Angeles and uh, he made really daring, complex, angry work um, and was able to show it and build an avant-garde um, theatrical community in Los Angeles. But when he died, he had a sort of curious thing in, um, placed inside of his will that said that none of his work could be performed after his death at all. So that meant that um, any audience member who wanted to engage with his work after that um, could only engage with it by watching the videos that were left behind by his theater company and shot by Adam Cope. Um, and so that's how I met his work. It was sort of given to me on an old VHS when I was at the McDowell Colony by um, Michael Amoreda, who told me I had to see it. Um, and he was told that a similar thing had happened to him in the early 2000s. And most of the people I know have had a similar relationship to Reza's work um, outside of the people who were able to see it in Los Angeles or in these weird lofts all throughout New York. Um, so I'm going to show you guys a little bit of this. We will cure you of your perversions. You return to your dung as a dog to its vomit. Come on, boys. Come out the window. Oh, my God. Twilight sleep, we can cure you. Incisions are made in the hairline, tucking sutures down the crease at the ear to the upper neck. Using a crowbar, he breaks a bone in her leg and he buggers her. <laughs> We're gonna bore desire right out of you. I should like to cut off a dead man's member and have it sewn onto me. I should like to be a man. I should like to rob a dead man's soul before it went to heaven and turn myself into a man. I would then seduce all the women. I want to take every man and every girl. I believe I'm too good for this calling. I should like to wallow in something, just so that I can say I wallowed in it. I know it now. I should like to wallow in corpses. I want to be stronger and stronger. I've never had a facial injury. I think I'd go mad if I ever did. Is my body now obsolete? Is my body now obsolete? Is my body now obsolete? My body's now obsolete. My body's now.
So that was Hip Hop Waltz, a bit of it, a taste. And um, inside of this Dropbox, there's the text for that play. And the amazing opportunity I see um, inside of this, thinking of communities, of communities that, get, that can be built in this moment, is how can like there be new communities built around radicality, right? Um, I think that, you know, given the political structures that are, the, the political um, structures that exist in our, in the left, left wing sphere of our country, there's a lot, there's been a lot of mobilization around radicality right now. Um, and a lot of people wondering where to put this radical energy in a space like this. And I think that um, looking at the theater um, and where, where we've been, where we're headed and what this moment means for us, a fear that I have um, for a new generation of playwrights is that um, the energy of radicality that, that had been sort of building um, in the theatrical landscape since like 2015 might start to disappear with the fears and um, nervousness around like how we're going to put food on our table um, when theaters inevitably do come back, right? Um, and generally the thing that people think must happen in those moments are a return to normalcy, a, a return to conservatism, because conservatism give like in our in our brains is how we um, is how uh, we keep the lights on, how how we invite the general audience and the general populace back in. But what if in these next six months, eight months, twelve months, um, we we created new spaces where um, the text, um, the videos, and the works that we were building in our little homes, in our self-isolation units, um, were works that um, didn't appease the masses or um, uh, pander to um, those of power, but were ones that we um, were building and making in order to dismantle, disrupt, and discomfit people in power? Um, and how can we create a community around that? simply with a text or simply with a video that's shared. You know, um, I think what any audience or any lover of Reza Abdo will say is that there is um, a fervent and hungry community of Reza Abdo acolytes. And many of those people never engage with his work in a theater, sitting next to another person. They might have engaged with it in a classroom, sitting with 12 people, watching a bad VHS rip. Um, projected badly by a teacher who still didn't understand how to use uh, her projector. Or um, they saw it like I did because an older mentor told them that they had to see this thing and they were given some scratchy DVD or some um, bumpy VHS and watched it there. So I think that like um, that's one of the opportunities that we can get um, right now when we think about how to um, how to write or how to make in this moment, um, look to the closet drama. Look to the look to the space where radicality um, can live freely on a page without the hindrance of a budget, without the hindrance of notes from uh, uh, community leaders or artistic leaders who may or may not understand what it is you're trying to you're attempting to do, um, and live with that freedom. You know. And I think that that's one of the things that me as a playwright, uh, that was one of my freedoms when I first started, was that I never thought that my plays would be produced um, in any real space, uh, especially not a space like New York Theater Workshop. Um, so when I wrote and when I've written, I've generally written with a, an unabashed um, push towards non-performance. Um, this idea that like what I was writing would never be allowed, so I should just write whatever I wanted you know, um, because there were no eyes that might come um, and pass judgment on as like inappropriate. Um, uh, so yeah, so that's one thing. Um, and I think that like that encompasses both um, relating to emotions and pushing to feel strange feelings and confront some new issues. Um, but something that's really great when thinking about um, Reza Abdo and um, Hip Hop Waltz to Eurydice um, specifically is that he used that, that play to tell the story of Eurydice in an entirely new way, a way that was completely specific to him. He um, embedded it with um, contemporary dance. He embedded it with um, stories of occultism and like histories of queerness that um, were heretofore like 
not um, juxtaposed in those ways with that narrative. And um, gender swapped in these wild, exciting, um, uh, revelatory ways. And I think that that's always the tool that we get to use when we're, um, when we're putting pen to paper to write a play. Um, we can always look at something that already exists as the first um, jumping off point um, to tell the stories that we're trying to tell for our communities now. So let's think of some stories that might work for right now, some stories that we can remix to make relevant for our moment um, that we're in now. Uh, one I've been thinking about a lot has been, um, has been uh, um, The Plague by Albert Camus. Um, I, I recently um, reread that and was sort of blown away by how, um, how prescient it was um, about our current moment and um, how we're responding to it. Um, Aaron, has, can we see if anyone has any recommendations for other plays that might, um, other plays or other narratives that we might be able to mine right now? Um, yeah. When thinking about this, uh, where we are? Yeah, so please feel free to chime in. The first one in is Endgame. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, the Decameron, The Hungry Woman by Sri Moraga. One Free Spare, No Exit, Brigadoon, Strange Interlude, Caucasian Chalk Circle, Mr. Burns, Parable of the Sower, uh, Nightwood by Juna Barnes. So many, oh my God. Heartbreak House by Shaw. The Enemy of the People, Victory by Howard Barker. Metamorphosis, Our Town, Far Away. Uh, Renee Polish's work. Great, great. We're gonna come back to this because I think we're gonna um, we're gonna build out some new play together or some new thing maybe by the end of this. But I love these as like jumping off points. Um, what were some other things that theater can give us that um, that we that we uh, feel we need for a play um, to make a play? You know. Is this, do you want more answers to your first question or is this a, yes, a new? Yes, answer? yes, more, more answers to my first question. Gotcha. Um, new ways of seeing and being in the world. And uh, there was one that I was really responding to. Let me find it again. Uh, better understanding humanity, should, an opportunity to heal. Um, let's see, As new perspectives. Um, theater either reflects back your own experience so you feel less alone or allows you to imaginatively enter into the experience of someone radically different from you. Okay, I'm, I'm interested in all of these, but I'm actually gonna hold off on pu putting them there because what um, what's curious to me is that many of these things don't feel specific to theater, right? They feel specific to art and like um, why we make art. So I wanna get deep into like what makes theater theater, right? I think that one of the things that when I think about theater that's difficult to recreate in any other space is liveness, right? Um, how, can we, how can we feel that sense of, um, of spontaneity, um, ephemerality and aliveness when we're alone, right? Or when we're watching, um, uh, when we're watching a tape or watching something else, like how how does that same exhilaration um, move through the space? Or what's our understanding of that? Because I know that for me, my understanding of that liveness comes by looking deeper at the audience that I am as a reader, which is one of the reasons why for me uh, the text of a play is so deeply important. Um, how it looks, how it moves, how it's shaped. Because how a text can, can um, move across a page can tell an audience um, of one, an audience who's reading a book, um, how, how, they're, how they should feel about it in a way that rarely happens outside of maybe poetry um, when reading, um, reading uh, the text of a, uh, of a book, right? Um, so I'm thinking about uh, the work of Alicia Harris, right? With Is God Is. Um, 
is got is has um the most alive um text um i've ever seen because there's this a uh, play with font this play with um intentionality of like the graphic layout of her words upon the page that inside of this audience felt um as spontaneous as hearing some hearing someone um perform uh a, you know a jacobean revenge monologue for the first time like that's the that that was one of the things that truly electrified me about her text when i first read it um and i'm gonna see if i can pull that up for you guys right now um are there any other um, recommendations or um, uh, specifications to that, Aaron? Uh, a space, somebody says a space to rehearse new behaviors and experiences, which feels uniquely theatrical to me. I agree, I agree. Um, what else? There's a comment, the, the distance between the seated viewer and the proscenium evokes the six foot distance that will be vital later on. How do I literally push something through the screen for you to touch, see, hear is a question that's coming up. Mm, mm. Okay, hold on. So can you read the one right before that and then I'll write this next one? Yes, um, it's a space to, to rehearse new behaviors and experiences. And then the one after that? Um, there was, it was a, it's a comment about the space between the seated viewer and the proscenium that's six feet that will uh, be vital later on. And how do you push something through the screen sensorially, touch, hearing, seeing? I like that idea. I like that question. You know, um, I've been wondering that a lot. You know, what are the experiences that, um, that like, if this is our, if this is our everyday, right? Um, what are techniques or ways that we can push something to the screen um, sensorially, right? Um, and I'm thinking about the fact that I'm, I'm not sure if they're on here. Um, let me see who our participants are right now. Because um, I might want to do a little play for you guys. Um, Um, okay, I see someone. Um, what I love is that there are so many technologies that we have at our fingertips right now that um, that sense of pushing through a screen, right? Um, that sense that um, anyone at any time could um, be uh, invoked specifically in a theatrical space um, is something that uh, I think is a really exciting provocation right now. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about what a play might look like um, if, if the play uh, would, the play utilized other, other mediums that we had at our fingertips, like a cell phone, right? Well, hello. Hi. How's it going? I'm good. I'm mute myself, so I'm not listening to it on the thing too. Did that feel, did you feel surprised when you saw your phone ringing? I did very much, yes. You did? What, did you- I thought it was a mistake for a second. I was like, <laughs> oh, he can't be meaning to call me. That's kind of probably what people felt like when the, when uh, the lead actress looked out in the audience at the end of Fairview, right? Like, this no. must be a mistake. She's not actually asking me to get on stage. <laughs> but I just- no, wait, what? I said, I said it must have yeah. felt like that. Um, I like the idea that like maybe this could be a way that we um, look at um, engaging an audience that might be um, only watching us online and then randomly the online, the fourth wall is broken by a simple phone call or text. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love that. It feels, it feels good. It gives you that same electricity. You know, it gave me the electricity that I felt as a performer whenever I would look out at an audience and have to see their eyes like, um, meet mine um, and know that I would, I, that I had the potentiality to do more with that gaze than, um, than I had done before. There's something really exhilarating about that. Yeah, 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 I totally get that. That's okay. Very cool. Well, thank you for being a part of this. <laughs> Anytime, thank you for making me a part of it. <laughs> Goodbye. Um, I assume that anyone in here whose numbers I have, I have their consent to do what I need to do <laughs> to, to, to figure these out. 
Um, but yeah, so like, I think that that's one option, right? Like, um, it's not the same in any way, shape or form, but it's, um, it's a type of sameness, right? Um, there's, a, there's a texture to that um, gesture that um, feels theatrical. Um, and I think is a, is a opportunity inside of a, the moment we have right now uh, that's rare and exciting. Um, and, 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 and thinking about like even the behaviors that I had to um, take on in engaging with um, a friend on the phone who I know pretty well, um, but in this new context, taught me some new behavior and gave me a new experience that I hadn't had before. Like the experience of calling Jeremy Blocker, that was Jeremy Blocker, by the way. Um, the experience of calling Jeremy Blocker, it never felt like that before for me because I've never called Jeremy Blocker in front of an audience of 300 plus people um, slash like the history of digital archive. Um, and that was something new and something special. And so, and, and so I think that both of these um, provocations to what dramaturgy in a dystopia looks like um, aren't, um, that I didn't solve them, but I do think that like we got to a space where we could see potentialities for how these things could be mimicked, um, resolved, or um, refound in this new space. Um, wait, before I open this, I'm gonna give you guys one more play, but I just have to, um, I have to get rid of something really quickly. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay, um, Aaron, can you give me, um, can you give me the uh, text for, um, uh, can you let me know what's going on with, um, with uh, the, the questions right now? Um, yeah, I mean, well, let's see what people are saying. There was a long list of other projects, uh, like text that we should return to. Is, is that what you're looking for? Yes, I can do that. But also, let me just get, um, I need to do one little thing, and I hate to do this right now, but I have to. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Great, yes, let's go ahead and do that. Great, I mean, some other texts that came up are Oedipus and Antigone, Prometheus Unbound, Blasted, Romeo and Juliet, The Normal Heart, Happy Days. Um, I think those are, those are the ones, that's where that, that landed. And then there's a lot of people talking about other things that theater offers, a surrender, something theatrically specific is a, a surrender of control a space to grieve, the threat of something going wrong or in a way we didn't expect, um, the possibility for immersion, mm. the risk of interruption, the failure of dramatic narrative to go as intended. Yes, yes. Um, again, I don't know that, um, I think that one of the things that, one of the opportunities we have here is um, to look at how those things can um, it, like, even in that phone call, you know, there was, there was a lot of failure in that phone call. There was also the, um, uh, <laughs> someone said to mention Hello Dolly um, in another text thread. Um, <laughs> so I'm just gonna mention that right now. Um, but I think that like, you know, all those same potentialities exist, but they exist differently, right? We saw them, almost all of those at play in that space. So I think that one of the things that I'm really, interested in is what what happens if we start writing plays um specifically for a medium that um is specifically for a medium that can trans that has like the limitlessness of the internet right and the limitlessness of um the digital landscape um like because i think that one of the things that um we think about as the amidst privilege of what we do in the theater is that there are so many limits to what we can do. Um, and what happens when we start eroding those limits, right? When we erode the limit of, um, uh, of like, you know, even the, like the space time continuum by essentially being able to call someone at 8.45 PM here at 3.45 PM um, in North America, right? Um, there's something really um, exhilarating about that. 
And then moreover, there's something really, um, there's a lot of potentials in looking at what the limits and um, possibilities are for just this space, right? This really dirty apartment. What happens if I'm just, do like it's a play, not a play, if I'm just doing it for um, myself and my partner. Is a play not a play any longer if I'm just doing it for myself and my, uh, and my neighbors, my friends, the men who live right over here? Um, one of my favorite activities recently has been doing little performances for my neighbors, um, which is deeply creepy. Um, but uh, they live right there. I don't know if you guys can see them. Fuck. Let's see. Can you see the window over there, Aaron? Yeah. Yeah. So these guys um, and I have created a friendship out of our um, little distance, right? Um, and like, so part of this is like, part of this mess has come from like days of playing like fun um, performance games with them where I have like essentially played the damsel in distress who doesn't know how to work anything in her kitchen um, <laughs> <laughs> to like <laughs> their delight and, um, and disgust. And it's been really fun. Um, and it's been like, just like a weird thing that I've done to keep myself occupied. But what if that became, um, what if what if I allowed my kitchen and my windows to actually be my stage in a real way? Um, that's a way that both the, the playwright can become both the director and the performer in the works that they're doing um, in this moment that I think is kind of exciting, um, even in its limits, right? Um, so, I'm going to, before we um, open this up for um, guest, I'm going to give you guys one more play or, or a, a group of a few more plays. Um, fuck, I just wanted to do something, but also, you know what, fuck it. I'm, I'm just gonna do it. Um, I don't know, can view sharing settings. There's some things in here that I don't want to be downloaded, so I don't know how to do that, but. Great. Um, am I sharing my uh, other screen right now? We can only see the, um, this drive folder. Great, great. So this is my drive. Um, I want to show you guys a couple other plays I wrote and a couple of the plays I've found that I think are like fundamental texts for um, playwrights to mine in uh, this moment. So um, I've already shown you guys Hip Hop Waltz of Eurydice. And um, as you guys can see, there's also um, the text here. So this is the text to Hip Hop Waltz of Eurydice, which is here for you guys to peruse. And then um, it's a little thing about Reza that I love. Um, I also have Carol Churchill's Drunk Enough to Say I Love You, which is a play that can only be created, um, I think, at a time like this, a time, a time of deep um, uh, uh, isolation, you know? Um, because one of the other gifts for a playwright in this moment is the gift of thorough, complicated, uninterrupted research which has been um, a major staple in how I write my plays. Um, I, I don't know how to write a play unless I've read everything in and around the subject that I can get my hands on um, until I don't, don't feel like I can read anymore. And I think that Carol Churchill in many ways as, um, as a um, uh, spontaneous a writer as she is, she also has that same impulse. I think um, um, mainly because of the ways in which she learned how to devise work as well. Um, and in her play, Drunk Enough to Say I Love You, um, she looks at, um, she like makes this deeply poetic and complicated work about um, America and um, the UK's relationship to um, war, um, a litany of wars. Um, but it's all embedded in these, in this really insanely beautiful um, uh, and like sparse dialogue. Um, and when you look at the dramaturgy that like builds out this play, you're overwhelmed because like 75,000 things are cited 
consistently. <laughs> like it's hard to keep up as you move through how, how it was even possible. And I think it, it's possible because she lives by herself and she spends a lot of time reading, you know? Um, so that's another great gift of this moment is looking at, um, looking at uh, like all of the, the, all the plays that you're thinking about writing and taking a moment, a day, a week to just read everything in and around the ideas of that play. So, um, let's see. Um, this is another text you guys should all read, Eleanor Fuchs, Waiting for Recognition. Um, because I think that even in this moment, even as we're th thinking about radical radicality and how we can move um, dramaturgies onto the page and, and off of the stage in really exciting ways, um, and maybe like out of the theater and into new spaces, spaces that you live in, spaces that you, um, wander through every day spaces that are more mundane than like the sort of like um gilded halls of a theater um we still can look at aristotle and uh like the poetics for the structures that they give us to create those emotional um breaks and um emotional shifts in an audience that we're so drawn to that's literally the drug of the, the of the theater as we know it um i also thought it might be important to show you guys um uh, this play by um, a writer I really love named Ruth Ada Gaines Shelton. Um, I think something that's really important for us to be thinking about when we think about the fact that um, we can't go to a theater right now. We can't go to like an institutional theater um, for the next year, six months, five months, whatever the fuck it's gonna be. Um, that there were a lot of people who were barred from ever having their work shown in the theater for a long time. Um, and that they still were able to create and make and make work that like will not be done, has not been done, um, but still exist in different ways and different forms. And this is a play which is ostensibly one of the first black satires ever written called The Church Fight. Um, it's written by Ruth Ada Gaines Shelton, like I said, and, and it was written in 1927 and it was, or 1926, sorry. Um, and it was published in a magazine um, and I think that like looking at how we might be able to um, unburden ourselves from the need to see all of the work that we do exist solely in a TCG hardcover um, or soft cover generally, or all the work we do exist at, you know, um, New York Theatre Workshop, Ars Nova, Playwrights Horizons, and maybe see that like there is the chance possibility um, that our work um, could exist just as well, just as lovingly inside of like a small chat book put together by you and a couple friends um, that can exist just as well in a magazine that you submit to um, in the hopes that they might want to do something different for once. Um, I think that these are some of the ways that we can unburden ourselves from the necessity of seeing dramatic literature only rendered many times badly um, on a stage, you know? Um, because I think that like sometimes the works that we're doing uh, have the value that literature has and isn't seen as having that same value because we haven't put that value on it. Because the value markers that we've placed upon dramatic literature for the playwright is on getting produced. And that is not a reality for most writers. And that's not a reality um, for, the, for the history of most playwrights, you know? Um, so thinking about new ways to unburden yourselves from that necessity is another opportunity of this moment. Jeremy, just to jump in to speak, there's a lot of people who are eager for the drive. What, when at the end of this class, there's going to be a link to a survey and you don't have to fill in your email address and your contact information, but you can. And I think the best way is for us to work with you afterwards and then anybody who submits their email address, we can send them something. So that way you're not giving everybody your email address and we're make, not giving out scripts that we can't give out, but we can put together titles. We'll figure it all out. And if you so, please, there'll be a link to a survey, fill out the survey, put your email address, and we'll get back to you later this week with as much of this stuff as we can. Great. Um, um, and then also just going through, I'm just going to speed round it. Ham, um, Hamlet Machine by Heiner Mueller, which I just think mo more playwrights should read. Um, then another seminal text um, on like, you know, a major shift in the theater um, for, away from like, you know, the necessity of bodies. Because that's another fact is that even if theaters reopen, will bodies be able to reenact, um, interact with each other? What happens if we start thinking about like the potentialities of plays um, that are beyond the human body um, and they can exist in other forms? 
Um, and then I have another play um, by Carol Churchill, Matt Forrest, which I think is a great play for us to look at right now. Um, and then uh, my play, The Fields, which is a play that I literally wrote for a basement. Um, it was a play for five friends to be done in a basement. And it was, um, it was, really, it was really great and really fun. Um, but yeah, okay. Great. Um, so we will get folks the, the text, the list of these texts and whatever texts we can. Um, let us switch to, let us switch to some, some questions from folks who are listening in. Yes. Um, I'm gonna get some wine for the question part. I'm like, so done it. Do it. Let's see. Um, you guys, I'm drinking a nice orange wine right now. You guys should all check it out. It's very good. Um, let us see. A question. Here's a question. Re-internet dystopia. How do you think and feel about the major communication networks and corporations, including Facebook, and their role in mitigating or enhancing dramatic storytelling and story sharing, or even just more basic forms of communication? Um. I think that the complicated thing is that um, we all have, to, like, you know, um, people beyond us and generations um, far ahead of us, like, married us to corporate overlords in ways that we can't untangle ourselves from. Mm -hmm. So I think that, like, you know, while we currently are entangled with them, there's, um, there, we can, we can be either burdened by them or um, lean into the opportunities they present to us, right? Um, like the, the 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 fact that I'm right now sitting thousands of miles away and able to connect with like X amount of people because of like, you know, um, a company as complicated um, as Facebook is um, really exciting for me. Like that's like a positive thing for me right now. Um, and so I think that, I think that what I try to do thinking about, um, uh, this relationship to the cor to corporations and um, and how they like can enhance us um, or mitigate what we do is um, I try to I try to move in and around um, the positives while making a lot of space for critique of the negatives. Sure. And perhaps the work is where that gets to happen. You know. Um, here's a question. Uh, you talked about communities that haven't been served as well as they could have, and learning from this moment. From a marketing perspective of shifting the Broadway audience, if you could repeat Bro Slave Play's Broadway debut, taking into account the lessons you learned at the workshop on Broadway and in this current situation, what would you do differently? What worked and what didn't? Oh, um, I think that, you know, um, well, I think that it's hard because I think that like thinking about what worked and what didn't um, would require me to, um, imagine a world where COVID-19 wouldn't have happened, right? Um, because I think that like given the run we had and what we did, it worked out really well, you know? And I think that um, a lot of the major choices we made were really great. I think that one of the things I fought a lot was, um, so uh, the, the way finances and theater work is that um, there, pre-sales are like the best thing you can ever give a play, right? Like it's like making sure your play has like a huge advance before you start is like a big, big deal. And I think that my, um, my disgust that, you know, the general understanding for the Broadway community of how to get huge pre-sales comes, um, uh, comes from New York Times readers and like American Express like holders, et cetera. Um, I, I wonder sometimes if I did the play a service or a disservice by saying that like, it was okay to have the New York Times, but like, I absolutely won't have a American Express like presale um, because I wanted everyone to have the chance to get orchestra seats early. I'm um, good orchestra seats early and not just American Express voters my, uh, or uh, holders. Um, and I think that looking back on it, I think that our early numbers would have been much better and it would have maybe helped us through some of the harder weeks in, the, in that sort of November, like into, um, December moment, but 
um, I also can't, like, I also am so happy that we were able to mobilize the kind of audience we did. But I think it's like the sort of like Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren thing of like, if you decide not to take like a certain amount of corporate money, that's going to mean you're not going to be able to have ads um, uh, in like, you know, South Carolina, you know, in the, in the same way that other people who are associated with like bigger corporations are. And so I think that like, um, being, being someone who was like, we're the outsiders, we also aren't doing this to make like money. Um, and I definitely didn't want it to ever be like, we're making so much money on slave play. Um, even though in order for people to see that our initiatives are working, we needed to say that in some ways, it, like, mm -hmm. it was frustrating. So I think that that's, I, I, don't, I still don't know what I would do differently in, cool. in that sense. Um, this is a kind of a series of different questions that go together. Um, at least in my mind, which is about, do you have, can you talk a little bit about your process and have you been able to write during the quarantine? Has this, or do you have tips for writing right now? Places you look for prompts, how to get, how to move from ideas to drama? Um, so, okay, so what I will say is that I probably have, there are people who are writing a lot. Um, Nick Pizzolatto is one of them. Um, and it's really fucking annoying to see people, um, not only writing a lot, but like t talking about writing a lot as though it's like um, like a sort of like moral imperative of this moment. Like, huh, we got all this time. I'm not gonna let time like shape me. I'm gonna shape time, um, which is literally what Nick Pizzolatto put on his fucking Instagram the other day and then put up that he had written four scripts. And I was like, good for you. Literally thousands of people are dying. Most of them are black. And I feel very comfortable saying that like I need to take space and time to like connect with my family and my friends in ways I haven't in the last two years because I was in grad school and then I was having you know a really weird whirlwind um, moment of doing plays um, and so it's been really lovely to take space away from writing and to find space to sit on FaceTime for an hour with a friend I haven't spoken to in a year. Um, it's been really lovely to sit and um, sit and take time and space to um, read books and re-engage with animes that I haven't been able to watch because I was in a full graduate program and trying to do a play off Broadway, you know? So like, um, I've been watching a lot of Neon Genesis, um, Evangelion, which I recommend to everyone. Um, I watched Carol and Tuesday. Um, I have, I watched like one like classic movie a night. Um, and so uh, the other day, or not classic, but like sort of art house movie. So I watched Alps by Yorgos Lanthimos yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that's what I've been doing for the most part, but I've just now started getting back to wanting to write, right? And I feel like it's again, my main, my main process of how I go from ideas to work. And this is only how I work, is that I fill myself up with inspiration um, until I feel like I'm about to burst. And all I have to do is like um, add to that conversation. Yeah. And so then I do. So it's like, I watch like 15 movies and then like, you know, a scene in, in Alps by Yorgos Lanthimos just drives me over the edge. And I'm like, I need to write a scene that's that good or else like, I can't, I can't even call myself a writer. And then I wake up the next day and write something that I feel really proud about or really shit about, but I've written something, you know? Mm. Um, but I also don't think that it's important for us to force ourselves when we can't do it. Because I think that there are bigger things at play in the world right now. And it's okay if those bigger things are are you know fogging our um our lens on the world hmm. um can you talk about your relationship to poets such as morgan parker are playwriting and poetry intertwined how so what do you see as the strengths and weaknesses of each so um one of my favorite writers is sarah rule and i don't know that i um ascribe to the same like poetry supremacy that she does but i do um i do really like poetry a lot and i think that for me it's just as inspiring as music. Like I have a really strong relationship to both music and poetry. Um, and I think that's because I like lyricism and what I hear in people's voices that I that draws me to theater and writing towards the voice, the spoken, vo the spoken voice, is that I hear rhythms. So I'm able to like mimic, pick up and like um, uh, recreate um, rhythms that have been around me vocally for my life. So I feel like in some ways I'm like a musician or a poet, um, just like in a different field, you know? Um, I like a little, I like a few more lights and a little more glitz and glamour, <laughs> like, you know, um, than, the, than the other ones. And, you know, I think that if I was a songwriter, I would be so 
unhappy with the weird lottery game of writing, being a pop songwriter, um, that it would just make me feel crazy. So I'd rather be in the lottery game of the theater because it's lower stakes. Um, so yeah, that's my relationship to poetry. Um, and there, there's some really amazing poets that I would recommend people read right now. Um, the first one that came to my mind was Tim DeLugos, T-I-M-D-L-U-G-O-S. Um, you should read his collection that uh, David Trinidad, who's another great poet, um, compiled together. Um, how did you work against the institution while being in school? I find as an undergraduate, it can be draining and limiting while trying to create work. Um, it is draining and limiting. And I think that um, I, I think I did it because all of my friends were doing it. I think that I was in a very specific class and part of a very specific group of students that had come to Yale who had been empowered partially by the institution to like question it. And I think that even when that questioning of the institution was frustrating for them and they reacted poorly, they had at least set up the space for us to do that consistently, um, which I think emboldened all of us to like lean into it. And I think that furthermore, I showed up to grad school really late. Like I had lived a full life um, in some ways, like I was 27. And so I think that like when you're, when you come to grad school at 27 instead of 22, you probably have like a, a, um, a lower tolerance for um, bullshit. Um, and so I definitely just like sort of squished that, um, that space between like, my tolerance of bullshit and my not tolerance of bullshit. Um, and I think that was really helpful because it made me make some of the best work I could have made there. And I think that um, it did help change certain things inside of the program that I think everyone at the school wanted to change, you know, but like, like every, you work in an institution, everyone that works in an institution, you, they, you need those sorts of conflicts and fights to get to the next space of growth, you know, or else you just stay stagnant mm -hmm. forever. Um, let's see. There's a couple of questions about how you write tone. Do you start writing knowing the tone? Does the tone shift? How do you, how do you think about tone in your writing? I don't think about tone. I think that just like my tone is always just like off the mark, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that like, I let my plays look like me, right? So like my plays have my sense of humor. My plays have like my willingness in real life to like, push a conversation or a relationship to the edge mm -hmm. um, and uh, see where it goes. And so it's exciting to me that, um, that like people see that as like an active choice when like, for me, it's just like me letting plays mm -hmm. move the way that like I would move a conversation or wish I could move a conversation if a conversation was just me talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when writing from experience, how do you decide what to edit out while still staying true to your original experience? What happened in life? Um, I don't think you can, I don't think you know, you, I don't think we, we can say how to do that. I think it just happens. I think, um, sometimes, sometimes like, you know, you have to protect yourself. Sometimes you have to protect, um, a relationship that's important to you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you decide to say, fuck it. I'm not, I want to burn it all down, you know? And I've done that, you know? I feel like I said, I want to burn it all down with my play Yell. I feel like I said I wanted to burn it all down with um, my play um, uh, uh, that you guys were about to see. Um, it was called um, A Boy's Come to Presents Tell Me If I'm Hurting You. And in some ways I wanted to burn down like everything that had to do with my ex-relationship while also protecting certain parts of it by like not putting his name in it, you know? Um, here's a question about how uh, how to find value in yourself if you're not getting validation from gatekeepers or elsewhere? Um, I think the way to find that validation is by having good friends around you. And I think that if having good friends and a strong community around you is really difficult, then um, the thing to do is, you know, I think, um, take a step away from looking at institutions, you know? I think that like I decided that institutions like weren't for me right at the time when they were like starting to say that they wanted me. And so that helped me move, um, move with like a stronger sense of self through those places because I'd already made a decision that like those places could not give me the value I needed. Like I made a decision when I was 26 years old that I had been poor, I was always going to be poor and that like, um, 
no institution could ever save me from like the sort of situation I was grown into, I was born into. And so that helped me move without the, the with, with less of a reliance on the resources they would give me to, to do the things I wanted to do, you know? Cause like, I could always just be like, well, you know what? I think I'm just gonna walk away. And I think having the ability to say, I'm gonna walk away took a long time, but I think it just comes with age and growth. Thank you. Um, if we can't simply go back to normal after this, what are you most personally and artistically anticipating in the new era ahead? I think that, I think that what I'm most nervous about in the new era is that because I don't think that theaters are taking as many steps as they could be, or at least not articulating to the community all the steps they're taking um, to um, batten on the hatches and like, um, and collectivize with other theaters, specifically smaller theaters, we'll lose out on some of the smaller theaters that help build and mature really exciting new work. Um, and so for the next four years, we might be in a drought of the most exciting voices because people would want to go back to marquee names that people know and less so um, uh, create space for that same sort of like ribald exploration that you can see if you go to the play group at um, Ars Nova or, you know, um, the writer director's lab at Soho Rep. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or even like some of the big international festivals, like I think not having those festivals in New York sure. um, or any of those traveling shows coming through America might stunt the growth of some of our next generation of directors and our next generation of playwrights. Because if, I, if, if people don't have access to like knowing what things Katie, Mitchell's, Katie Mitchell is up to, then they might never reinvent the work that they were doing um, in, Kansas City or wherever they're seeing it. Cool. Um, let's see, here's a, it's a, uh, let's see. As someone whose plays often depict sex and intimacy, and as queer people, there's a certain joy in showing queer sex on stage. How are you thinking about staging intimacy for online art or art six feet apart in the age of COVID-19? Um, I mean, I think that there's like, um, there's, there's a lot of ways to stage intimacy, you know what I mean? I could like show you now, but I think that like, you know, most people have already been engaging with intimacies online since they were 11 or 12 years old. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, like, I think that like ever since we've had like, you know, a Pornhub subscription uh, or not subscription, most people buy it, get it for free. Um, <laughs> they've been engaging with, um, they've been engaging with digital intimacy in some way, shape or form. Even since we were in like chat rooms, I know that like um, millennials, uh, have a different relationship than maybe Generation Z, but like growing up and going into like a dark room um, where no one knew what I looked like, I could be anyone I wanted in AOL, you know? Mm -hmm. And there was something exhilarating about that and something that you feel in a more tangible way than I've ever seen on stage. And like the closest I've ever felt to that sort of um, um, electricity of the unknown is like being in like the dark room in like a gay bathhouse, you know, or the dark room in like the back of a club in Berlin, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that like those are the potentialities for that in a digital space, you know. Hmm. And a related question: How do you think TikTok will influence theater making? I don't know. I mean, I think that like you know, in the same way that like. Um, theater has become more imagistic, I think, um, especially American theater has become more imagistic since the advent of, or the popularity of Instagram. Um, everyone's sets has become very like Instagrammable. Um, I think that like, we're gonna see um, maybe some quicker, um, some quicker cuts in the works that people do. I mean, mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, someone like Will Arbery and his play Plano, like there's already, there's so much um, inside of that play that like relates to early digital art and like the work of someone like um uh and the, and the work of a lot of TikTok artists that i could name right now that you guys probably wouldn't know so yeah so i think that there's something to that um this is a, another process question but could you talk about how you structure your plays and the process that goes into them and there was a secondary uh, or not a secondary but there was another question about the process of writing slave play particularly well i think that generally structure is the thing because i've read so many plays structure is the thing that comes to me sort of naturally like i can ape a structure really well mm -hmm. and so i um 
tend to um, think about a play structure for like it's like title then idea then structure comes like comes out of all those things and it sort of happens in a quick succession for me um, and so when I was working on slave play I knew that I wanted it to start in that space of discombobulation in act one that like so where the iris slowly revealed itself revealed itself and then got really wide and then went in for a close-up at the very end you know mm -hmm. um that was that was what i always knew the play the shape of the play was going to be and then it was about filling in that space um after the fact cool i'm trying to see what the oh here um how do you approach writing for film and tv versus writing for theater um, film and TV is an entirely different language and I um, am still very much a novice. And I think that what is difficult about writing for the film, writing for film compared to writing for theater is that most of us has, have experienced plays as text. Um, and most of us have not experienced um, film as text or TV as text. We all experience that as like something we watch. So imagining how to think not like less like a director and more like a, a writer for film and TV is a difficult thing. And so I think I'm still learning. Cool. Well, it seems it feels like we're coming to the end of the time. Is there anything that you want to leave us with? Um, I would leave you guys with um, stay safe, um, stay inside. Um, think about ways that if you have privilege, you can reach out to those who don't and offer a supporting hand. Um, I've been doing that to the friends of mine around me who I think um, may not may not know that I can like help them out right now. And like, you know, and I offer any help I can, even if it's just talking on the phone. Um, so do that. Um, I think that if you are someone who um, doesn't come from privilege, don't, which I didn't for much of my life, um, don't be afraid to ask someone for help um, because a lot of people, especially in a moment like this, are willing to help. Um, and I think that what's more important than not asking for help um, and starving is asking for help and maybe getting some food on your table this week. Well, thank you so much um, for being with us and thank you for your generosity in sharing that. For everybody who's listening in, again, there's a link to a survey that's coming out in the Zoom. It's going to be in the comments. If you include your email, we will get you uh, some version of Jeremy's Google Drive. Um, and as I said at the beginning of the class, these, all of the programming that we're doing is free for the entire community. And we're grateful for the opportunity to be expanding our community uh, beyond people who are able to physically be on 4th Street when that is where our community is based. Um, and all the artists who are participating in this programming and our staff is continuing to get paid. If you, are, if you are in a position of privilege, if you could make a gift, 25, 10, $5 to the workshop, uh, we would be so appreciative of that to make sure that the lights can be back on when we are able to gather again in the group. Um, so you can find it. There's also, you can, you can find that information online in addition to the information that we're, being, we're posting. Um, and I also just wanna be uh, celebrating the work that is upcoming. Um, the next two Mondays in April, we have a master classes. Next week, it's gonna be the Tools of the Artist with Celia Keenan Bolger. Um, and we're gonna close out April with a conversation and a master class with Liliana Blaine Cruz, a director, and Adam Rigg, a designer, on how they imagine worlds together. Um, we have fireside chats on Wednesdays. Celine Song is coming up this Wednesday. Next Wednesday, Martina Mayo, Rebecca Frecknell, and the cast of Sanctuary City. Um, and then we're gonna close out April with uh, a conversation with Martha Redbone and Aaron Whitby, uh, wonderful composers and musicians. Um, what else do we have? There's an open mic this Thursday evening on Zoom. Please come to the open mic. On Sunday evening on Instagram Live, uh, Daniel and Patrick Lazor are gonna be giving us a, a little concert uh, with some songs from their musicals and their EP. Um, and next Friday, the 24th, we're gonna have a conversation uh, led by our education director about um, teaching theater online. And we have a whole slate of programming in May that we're about to announce as well. So that's a lot of information. Go to our website, it's all there. Jeremy, thank you so much. As always, it is a true pleasure and a gift. Um, and thank you all for being here. We hope to see you virtually back soon and please stay safe and healthy. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Bye, thanks Jeremy. <laughs>